Hello, everybody. This is Jose Palomino with another episode of the Revenue Throughput Podcast. And today we're going to talk about something that I know many of you have struggled with figuring out where it fits in your priorities, how to get your head wrapped around it, how to actually work with people in the field. And that, of course, is PR and social media, just that part of your communications that can seem a little fuzzy. But in fact, you know, because you see others around you in the marketplace, having success with it, using it, but it's still a little bit mysterious. So our guest today is none other than Cass Bailey, CEO of Slice Communications, a real leader in this area. And I think we're going to learn some real great insights that you'll be able to take from this podcast episode and immediately start applying to your business as you look to grow your markets, grow your revenue, connect with your customers, and increase your success. So without further ado, let's welcome Cass Bailey to our podcast. Well, welcome, Cass, to the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Hi, Jose. Thanks for having me. Oh, you know, my my great pleasure. And, uh, you know, I've known you, Cass, now for probably over 10 years and been part of your journey. So I think what would be really cool for our listeners is just a simple question. Who do you serve and what do you do for them? And we're going to take it from there. Sure. So we have a marketing communications business that really focuses on public relations, social media, email marketing, and content. And we do it primarily for recurring revenue and royalty businesses. Some of those are for profit, some of those are nonprofit, but really people who are out there selling services or getting donors on a regular, ongoing, recurring basis. So they have to communicate to an audience systematically, ongoing, regularly, and so on, right? That's exactly right. So I want to jump on one thing because, you know, our audience tends to be a little bit more on the pure B2B industrial side, but, you know, they still have to work with customers and communicate with them. Uh, You mentioned PR, right? So, you know, so there's so much been written in the last several years about like the death of PR. PR is not relevant Mm -hmm. and so on. So I'd like to just zero in on that because I think it'd be very helpful. How should an owner operator of any kind of business think about PR in their strategic framework? Like how important is it anymore? How is, how is it different? When you think about media, there are really three types. You have owned media, so your own things, your own social platforms, your own blog, your own website. You have paid media, so ads and sponsorships and things like that. And then you have earned media. And earned media is where PR has always historically played. Now, earned media is changing a little bit. Yes, that's true. The number of publications have changed over time. Um, Being in the media business is a hard business to be in, especially earned media. But that said, the credibility and trust that comes with earned media, can th- there's no comparison. It is the place where people go because they understand that it has been vetted by a reporter, it's been vetted by an editor, it has a lot of credibility. In most cases, it's been well-researched, especially in the B2B space when you look at the, in, the industry trades. But earned media and getting coverage in a media outlet is only one type of PR. We also think about industry relations as it relates to getting speaking opportunities at conferences. Again, that comes with high levels of credibility. And getting awards and recognition also falls within the PR realm. And that is about credibility and also about trust of the industry. And so earned media, getting media placements, getting speaking opportunities, getting awards, all of those things will put you in a place where you're getting more brand impressions from the right people and also you're staying top of mind because people are seeing you again and again. The last thing though, Jose, that your audience needs to know is that a media placement is only as good as the people who see it. So if you get a great media placement and your customers didn't happen to open that online publication that day or they didn't happen to open the trade journal because they were on vacation that week, it's your responsibility as the company to make sure that the people who need to see that media placement see it. And that's where we see the most successful companies are using their media placements on their own social media channels. They're using their media placements and sending them to their clients and customers and others through email. They're using their media placements by giving them to the salespeople and having the salespeople use them as follow-up and and points of contact. So earned media still has high levels of credibility and can be super valuable when you use it well. So I just want to dig in a little bit on the earned media because what Mm -hmm. I'm hearing is when you have trusted authorities say good things about you, that has a lot more value. I mean, it seems intuitive, right? But it has a lot more value than you just saying good things about yourself. 
Sure. Let's let's do an analogy just real quick. A lot of uh, business to business owners we talk to uh, talk to me about how they get most of their business through referrals, through word of mouth. And the reason referrals work is because it comes from a trusted source. This okay. is just another trusted source. But at scale now, it's at not one scale. referral, two referral, but it's actually like, you know, and again, in different trades. Now, one thing I've seen in, in some of the more niche trade journals is a lot of what seem obvious pay to play. Right. So like mm -hmm. it's like the articles here and right next to it is the is the ad. Yeah. yeah. So so, how you know, and, and I've seen I've actually had clients that were spending a lot of money to get that. And it, besides the ad cost, just to get it. And I said, well, that's that doesn't have quite the same juice, I don't think. So any mm -hmm. any thoughts on that? Yeah, what we found is that media coverage that is written by a reporter or an editor as opposed to a byline article that you write for yourself always has more credibility. Uh, that said, if you have an opportunity and you decide to invest in bylined articles, you need to make sure that it really reads like an editorial piece, that it doesn't read like a marketing piece, because so much of trust comes from tone. So if you are going to invest in that sort of thing, make sure that your tone is one that is of a journalistic style because you'll get a higher perception of credibility and trust from that as opposed to it just being, hey, our stuff is great. Right, right. Because what else are you going to say? I mean, that's, that's the expectation, right? Okay, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. That's a really good clarification. Now, I've just working with a lot of owner-led businesses, probably in the um, several million to maybe $20, $30 million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, they've all got, they're like on their fourth social media agency, right? Sure. And it's just not happy. And, and here's what they're not happy with. It's not that it hasn't turned on a ton of business, but that it's often engaged with like, it's a black art. Don't worry, we got this thing. And, or you have people talking very fast about things and, and, you know, it's almost stereotypical, the older owner saying, you know, I don't know about those TikToks and those tweets and, and you know, <laughs> and that. But it seems like there's a real disconnect between what's happening in social and the ability of leaders to really be made comfortable with it, mm -hmm. right? So, like, what are some things an owner should be prepared to, okay, next time I engage a social firm, um, these are some key questions I'm going to ask to make sure they have my best interests at heart. And I don't want to get bamboozled with jargon. A lot of companies treat social media like a satellite, like it's out there in space doing its own thing, kind of hovering around the planet, but kind of not. And that's the biggest mistake that we see is that there's no internal alignment about social media's job. What is its role within the company? And so what we encourage owners to do and leadership teams is to sit down and talk about if you had to write a job description for your LinkedIn page, what would that job description be? Or if you're going to use Facebook, what would that job description be? Or Instagram, or like you said, TikTok, or Nextdoor, or Clubhouse, or any of these, right? There's lots of different social channels. But the way that people use the social channels is very, very different. So one, you need to know how are you going to use it? What is your job description for your social channel? And two, how do other people use it? And then you have to figure out, like, does that connect or does that co not connect? So for instance, LinkedIn is still our primary B2B channel. People use it, and we know this from LinkedIn, to research companies and products and people before they decide to do business with them. So your LinkedIn channel's job might be to help you find new people who could buy from you, to promote your products, to promote your people, to make sure that you look like a real, credible organization that is sophisticated and that is thoughtful in the work that you do and is energized and has really amazing people that you wanna do business with. Your LinkedIn channel's job might also be to showcase your thought leadership, those media placements that we talked about. Its job might be to showcase um, the work that you've done, your case studies. But what happens is that nobody sits down, quite often those who become frustrated with this, their social media presence, they don't sit down and say, this is what its role is within my company. And if it does its job within my company, my company will be better for it. A lot of times leadership teams bring in social agencies to do check the box. Oh, you got to do social. You got to do social today. All the kids do social, got to do it. And that's where we see the problem that they're just checking the box, doing social and not really understanding and aligning on what it's supposed to do for their company. And in fairness to the third party practitioners who are trying to do social for them, if it's check the box, chances are that ownership team or that leadership team isn't as invested as they need to be. So That's it's like, right. make social work for me. Yeah, they're not getting... <laughs> 
from the agency side, we're not getting clear direction and there's no alignment. That's the other problem. When you're just doing check the box social, the CEO thinks it's one thing, the VP of sales thinks it's something else, the head of recruiting or HR thinks it's something else, the head product officer thinks it's something else. And they've never had that conversation about the job description. And so there becomes this frustration and misunderstanding because everybody has different expectations and there's no alignment. Well, it's interesting. I love the term job description, Cass. I think that's very helpful because you think about it, whatever the investment you make, let's say in LinkedIn, even if you do roll your own or you hire somebody, it doesn't matter. You're going to invest some time, energy, effort, and that has value. That has economic value. It costs you something. Even mm -hmm. if it's your VA doing something for you, that's time that you're paying for. It's not free. Sure. So you wouldn't hire somebody without a job description. Not Absolutely. Not, not typically. <laughs> you shouldn't no. anyway, right? Or some general sense of what you hope they do when they when you hire them, right? Yeah. Or, or what are successful outcomes for that hire, for example? Mm -hmm. So just th mm -hmm. that whole job description mentality, I think, is really powerful in how to look at these different social, and and it's it's not really about the platform, right? Mm -hmm. It's not LinkedIn versus Facebook versus this. It's like what do we want this social thing to do for us, and then then let's pick the platforms that make sense. That's exactly right. So a lot of times we talk to leadership teams and they say, should I be on Instagram? And we're like, I don't know. Who are you trying to communicate with? And what are you trying to talk to them about? Okay, well then are those people on Instagram and do they want to hear about those things while they're scrolling through their Instagram? And the answers are usually pretty clear, yes or no. But you have to ask those questions first and understand what it is that you wanted to do before you decide to engage on social channels. So this is an interesting word too, which often gets used in social media circles, of course, engagement. Oh, yes. So mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the challenges I see for smaller companies is that social, although it technically it's free in that the platforms are free to use, right? It's a massive amount of, right, I, I see your reaction, a massive amount of effort, like just sheer sweat that you have to put into it to do it well yeah. Can you comment on how can a small company, like what should they be thinking about in terms of time investment? Can you really outsource that to somebody to just be you on social, especially if you're in a technical category? You know, you sell a, a cyclotron or some other crazy mm -hmm. machine, you know, at some point taking somebody who's, you know, maybe very good, but a couple of years out of college who's never studied engineering mm -hmm. to be you in an engineering like stream. How, how do you how do you wrestle with that? The first thing, Jose, to your point is that social is no more free than a website is free. You have to invest in a website. You have to maintain a website. Everybody knows that. And social is very much the same thing. In terms of how to decide what to invest, we start with what we call the five types of attention. There are five primary types of attention that any business needs. The first one is you need awareness. People need to know that you exist because if they don't know that you exist, they can't do business with you. The second thing is that it, the second type of attention is connected attention. It's where people say, okay, I want to know a little bit more. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to check out your site. I'm going to be open to retargeting. I'm going to sign up for your newsletter, right? They make a connection with your brand. The third type of attention is that engaged attention. And engaged attention is where they start to have a two-way interaction. There begins to be a back and forth. And I think that's the clearest and simplest a way to define engagement is they are talking with you in one way or another. Then we have converted attention. And this is where they become your customer, your client, your employee, your investor, your donor, et cetera, your referral partner. And then the last type is the advocate attention. And this is where people are using the attention that they get to help you get more attention. So we want, we want leadership teams and marketing teams to be really thoughtful about what type of attention is going to be your priority for the next 12 to 18 months. And let's be very open and honest about this. You can't just skip to converted attention. You can't do it. If people don't know that you exist, they're not just going to magically become your customers. It doesn't work that way. So be really honest with yourself about how much awareness you have in the market. Do most of the people that you want to know about you, do they know about you? And if the answer is no, that's where you need to begin. And once you decide where you need to begin, that's when you can start to figure out your budget. Was well, it gonna take a heavy lift to create a lot of awareness in your market? Probably, probably you're probably gonna have to make a bigger investment. However, there are some companies who have high levels of connected attention. A lot of people know who they are. A lot of people are connected with them and they're just not turning it into business. That's a totally different approach to look at in terms of your marketing communications. So you could actually have a lot of back and forth 
or a lot, a lot of connected. So you, so people, you know, the classic. And I, I had a client that was dealing with this. They had a lot yeah. of people that signed up. They they had they had a huge mailing list. Yeah. But they weren't able to get uh, to go beyond that. It just kind of stuck there. People liked their content. Right. But they didn't move it into anything next. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's Plus. exactly that's exactly the case. And so when companies start to be really honest with themselves about the work that they need to do and where they need to prioritize, what types of attention they need to prioritize, then they can make better choices about investment and how much to spend. Wow. And, and you know, the, but the challenge is, let's say, you know, typical company in a $10 million range, they're willing to spend money. Mm-hmm. Their concern is they feel out of their element in in terms of spending it safely in mm-hmm. other words, they, because they spent it before they've, they've they've burned through six figure budgets for a couple of years and they just haven't seen the results i love the construct though which is now you have awareness you have uh, connectedness engagement converted and advocacy right so let's just move to that thought there so let's say i make these investments i start figuring this thing out mm-hmm. and uh, i have customers how do i how do i leverage some of these communication tools to encourage my customers to be advocates, right? That's like the the gold standard is that they're actually, if I'm getting business from existing customers, and we use that as a measure of just customer satisfaction as well. But how do do these vehicles help us do that? The way that you move audiences from converted to advocate is by giving them something inspiring, by saying that to them, if we do this thing together, if you help us with with this thing, it's going to work for you. It's going to be better for us. We're going to do this together. And what that means in most cases is an ongoing parallel path communications plan and strategy. So you have your overarching comms plan, how you're communicating with most people, but you do need to have this parallel path just for your advocates, your customers, your best employees, your champions, et cetera. And you got to outline that in and of itself, it's gotta be its own thing with its own resources, because it is gonna be different than communicating with the general public or the other people in your audience. You need to talk with them regularly. You need to give them insider information. Hey, we're about to do this thing. We're about to launch this campaign. We're thinking about this. Can you help us with this? And the powerful ask is what makes everything. And the powerful ask usually comes from a place of inspiration. So it is its own thing, but what we find is that companies that do this incredibly well, who get, keep, and use advocate attention are the ones who hypercharge and get the best ROI out of their marketing comms. Wow. So, you know, right away, I'm trying to associate this. I'm trying to visualize a number of, of clients that we've worked with and people who are listening to this podcast who may come from, let's say, industrial categories, manufacturing, and so on. Mm-hmm. So I could see them engaging their customers maybe with ideas for next product mm-hmm. uh, we'd love you we'd love your take on something we're thinking of developing or a service we're thinking about so mm-hmm. now you're my collaborator as yeah. opposed to just being somebody i'm asking to, p- to place a next order yeah are, are those things that would help and that's creating that same vibe that's a great example um hosting webinars or podcasts where you have your advocates on as guests is a okay. great example jose okay. um, co-writing a bylined article or a white paper co-presenting at a conference all of these are things that benefit both the the client the customer mm-hmm. and the company right, right. Right. Wow. Yeah. Okay. If you have a very thoughtful, ongoing, year-long plan that's right. really focused on those people and bringing them into the loop, bringing them into the circle, and making sure that they benefit as well, you will see a dramatic difference in terms of people out there talking about how great you are without you always having to do it on your own. Okay. Well, that's that's really. I love the idea of not having to do it on your own. I think that's such a because again, a lot of these companies they kind of work a little bit in isolation or. Often they are end up they end up working with procurement at large mega corporations, mm-hmm. which is a little harder to crack the nut in terms of collaboration because you're not at a high enough level there. But there's plenty of opportunities in what you've described. Mm-hmm. Now, Cass, I'd be remiss on having an opportunity to speak with you today. And first of all, just thank you for these like real gems that you've shared with our audience. Uh, but you yourself are an entrepreneur. You are running a business. And you've you've navigated the waters of like uh, the pandemic, and here here we are. So I, I'd like to just take a moment or two and focus a little bit on you as an owner, if that's okay with you. Of course, sure. Okay, so one of the things that um, the, a big transition, right, is people working from home, 
right? And the whole idea of the the workforce. And I and I, I and I because I, I visited your offices had great spread and so on in in downtown Philly and and now I believe you're moving more towards people actually being able to work from home and so on. How has that transition worked for you? And what would you say to fellow owners who are saying, should I pull everybody back in from, you know, they got comfortable, they, but maybe they got too comfortable. Maybe maybe I'm not getting the productivity I need, or I think I won't get the productivity I'll need down the road. What should I do? What, what are your thoughts there to, and think about this, you're speaking to fellow business owners, your, your own experience. Our virtual working really works for us. I think there's a couple reasons why. One is that our team is all on the younger side and very, very comfortable with all technology and tools. So that's been great. We have found a way to continue to have brainstorms and to be creative and to collaborate because we made that a priority. I've also personally made it a priority to over communicate with my team. I talk to my team all the time and the feedback that I'm getting is that I'm more accessible to them now than I've ever been um, through the entire leadership of the company. And then finally, we've put a real effort on culture and maintaining our culture. So at least once a month, we have an in-person gathering uh, this month, which is July. We're having a Christmas in July party where okay. we're getting everybody together. It's gonna be tons of fun. So we prioritize these in-person memory making experiences on top of being in constant communication with each other and it works for us wow so that leveraging the technology mm -hmm. uh but also realizing there is something about being in the same room with people still matters to some you know we're still human we still want that connection but yeah. the accessibility thing i think is very interesting Cass, mm -hmm. because uh, I, and I've heard this from others that, you know, when everybody's in the same office and you were in, in the, let's say, the proverbial corner office, you're actually not that accessible because the doors mm -hmm. close, you're in this meeting, that meeting, people don't mm -hmm. feel they can pop mm -hmm. in, they can't just send you a message, they don't want to disturb you because they see how busy you are. Mm -hmm. And and perhaps now it's just a matter of, you know, I don't know if you use Slack channel or whatever, but you, you, can, you can communicate very easily. And you, but part of that, you as a leader have made that available to your team. I have. And yes, we communicate using Google Chats all day long. We are on video conference with each other constantly. And it just really works. Um, before, I was out of the office a lot. I do a lot of business development. I do a lot of speaking. I attend a lot of conferences. So there would be days or weeks at a time where I was just gone. And it was hard to communicate with them virtually at that time, uh, even on chat at that time. And, and now being more present, being more available, being more accessible is something that I'm going to continue to prioritize because I've learned the value of it. Wow. Well, Cass, we are at the end of our time and it's been great. I've just loved catching up with you. I think some killer insights on how I think anybody could start thinking about social media to get a control of it. If it's not their specialty, to not be afraid of it, right? That they can actually do something with it. And I love the job description idea. That's golden. That's a really good way to look at it. If somebody listening to this podcast says, gee, that Cass sounds really sharp and you do, uh, and they want to know more about you and your work. How? What's the best way to get a hold of you and to just learn more about you? The good news is I'm one of the easiest people to find on the internet. You can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram okay. and Facebook and all of those things. You can also find us at SliceCommunications.com. SliceCommunications.com. Fantastic. Cass Bailey, it's been fantastic having you on the call. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you, Jose.